talk us, to us about the causal persistence in Lyme neurofibromatosis. Which is a lot to say. But it's easier to say than Eliadosis. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm going to talk to you about some work that's been going on in the set practice. So, our laboratory works on pathogenic Borrelia, both class of fever and Lyme disease. So, Lyme disease is the most common vector for disease in the United States. And this is a disease that's endemic across the northern hemisphere. We have here
judicial system. And we've struggled a lot with this. We really love to do micrograph and tick bites because that's how things happen in nature. But you can't control the number of bacteria. And it's really hard to get neurological involvement. So we have to use lots and lots of animals. But we know with from our work and more others have done that if you affect rats on TV, we can get neurological involvement within hours and we can detect the regard for the rates of those rats about 85% of the time. So what we've done is we've infected rats IV and then we take a cohort and treat them with antibiotics and another cohort that is not treated with antibiotics. Now to make sure that our antibiotics work, we look by culture. We are not able to detect any live bacteria in the rats that receive these antibiotics. What we see with RT-PCR is not here on the bottom. So we're looking at the transcript because the baby dwarf fry is alive. It's going to be transcribing. We're looking at the flagella transcript here because these are mold bacteria. They're always made with flagella. And you can see in the infected animals that do not receive antibiotics, we can detect transcript and we can't detect it in the animals that receive antibiotics. What we can detect, however, is DNA and antigen in these animals. So on the top, we're looking at baby dwarf fry DNA. So this is one month after we stop antibiotic treatment. And you can see both the infected animals and the animals that got baby dwarf fry plus antibiotic, that we can detect DNA in those animals. And that's maybe not surprising, DNA is pretty stable. On the bottom, we're looking at baby dwarf fry antigen. So this is just the melanocin. And we collect protein from the brain. And then we're detecting antigen by an antibody, polyclonal antibody in the whole outer surface of baby dwarf fry. And we have three animals here that were infected that did not get antibiotics, four animals here that were infected that got antibiotics. This is our uninfected animal for negative control and positive control where baby dwarf fry has a membrane protein. And you can see in both groups that we have detected the antigen. And this is one month.
pathogen associated with black cattle that cells are going to recognize as a threat. And you can see both the transcript and protein that just this piece of being pure black cattle, but just this piece can induce an inflammatory response to these cells. We then screen some PCR arrays for microbial response to be pure black or chemokines and other layer factors. And she can't see all this here, but we treated these cells with non-virulent BPRFI, live BPRFI, then BPRFI. We see more of a robust response to virulent BPRFI, whether live or dead. There's really no difference between transcript levels. But if you look at protein, we see something totally different. So there's a lot of stuff on the slide, but I want you to just focus in on these arrows. So the first half of each graph is 24 hours after stimulation, the second half is 72. And in every case, this bar, these taller bars, these are busted up back here. So we stimulated these cells either with non-virulent BVRFI, virulent BVRFI that was alive and intact, BVRFI that was killed with antibiotics, and BVRFI that had been killed with antibiotics and sonic cancer. So we really busted up that bacteria and released all those pathogens associated with that. In every case, you can see how much taller those bars are in comparison to all the other conditions. So we're getting a really robust response to pieces of that. So one of the things we started to wonder about, just because when we were treating these cells with a lot of people who are probably, you just look at these cells under the microscope, you see a nice cell, and we can see completely intact spirochetes, pretty hard to see here, associated with these microglia. They're completely intact. And that got us wondering, can these microglia even diastasize these bacteria? Are they able to take them up? So we started to look at a number of basophosis related factors in these microglia in response to being chlorified. And again, this is data from a PCR array. We looked at a number of different factors that should be upregulated when a microglia or a macrophage wants to diastasize something. And here the pattern is, is less clear. So this is for live bacteria, dead bacteria, and dead bacteria that have been busted up by some infection. And you can see that we're getting response to a number of these factors, like CD14, like the 12, Marco. We're definitely seeing a response to the live bacteria. There's a bit of a trend of a form of response with the busted up bacteria, but not as clear cut as we saw with the hemocons and cytokines. And again, these are some more of those genes, so complement receptor 3, CSF1, and MIM5. So this brings me back to, can these microglia actually diastasize the chlorophyte? And a number of those genes that we looked at are involved in different levels of diastasis that can be involved in taking up the chlorophyte. So that's the gamma receptors, complement receptors 3, CD14, Marco. And there's three different ways that the chlorophyte can be diastasized by macrophages and macrophages itself. So either by oxidization, and then through the gamma receptors, 
inside a cell is probably an artifact or maybe just a, a temporary stopping ground. But this is not an extra cell or cow does not want to live inside a cell. But it may initially hide inside cell. So we really think these factors come together that are going to determine the kind and intensity of the immune response to this bacteria and ultimately to the puzzle of neural neurons. And I just want to finish by thanking all the people who did the work. Um, really terrific collaborators, John Watt, Matt Rosenberger, Archie Nasrath, all the past and current members of my laboratory. I want to especially point out some of the undergrads who contributed to this work. These are really the unsung heroes. Eric Keyes, Margaret Burke, and Jake Greenmeyer, as well as some very talented medical students who Where it is, 
that maybe they don't need to go anywhere, but just the presence. Do they think that is enough to bring in the critical response, and that's what can do some of the information. So those are things that we definitely need to parse out, whether it's coming from microglia inside or Uh, 
uh, particularly gold and water. A tinea crust, uh, tinea solium or its uh, related family members like tinea crusts, they speak to, uh, in fact, uh, the vein of rodent that, you know, mechanically they have to dig inside. So we use the related parasite, which is necessary and hot type. It doesn't naturally affect the humans, but it has a similar life cycle, one secondary host and a primary host. Or uh, in case of tinea crust, uh, tinea solium, humans have the definite host, but in case of encortai, um, the definite host is rodents or dogs or it is bugs. So we used uh, encortai to develop uh, the murine university surfaces model and till date that the only model available to study immunopathology <coughs> in the central nervous system uh, environment for to, uh, to study the immunopathology associated with this disease in rodent model. Okay, so what do we do? We inject uh, infrapranially and cortai into the brain, and then um, we analyze the various immunological parameters, so it mimics the symptomatic NCC human patients. So, so that was good. We, we unfortunately we did not have the asymptomatic state because we are infecting the mice infrapranially, say, 30 to 40 parasites. So we don't have that three to five years of asymptomatic state, but we have the symptomatic parallel to the symptomatic NCC uh, patient uh, stage. Some of the knockouts we used, and we figured it out that uh, reduced uh, inflammation, particularly reduced TH1 uh, type of inflammatory response, is correlated with reduced disease severity. But interestingly, we found that in case of TH1 knockout mice, that even if the inflammation was down, but those mice are highly susceptible in contrast to my DNA. And um, we stumbled upon um, alternative activated macrophages uh, that somehow TLR2 was uh, inducing alternative activated macrophages in this infection model. And uh, with subsequent studies, I'll show you a slide later that alternative activated macrophages are the necessary and sufficient for protection to this infection, at least in the model. So, before I go to alternative accurate macrophages, you know, microbes like, you know, bacteria or fungi or virus, they release uh, molecules like trans, like co like the ligands, and PRI pump interactions leads to production of uh, inflammatory cytokines. Together, the ligands and the inflammatory cytokines can activate the macrophages to produce inflammatory mediators and this type of activation phenotype is called as M1 or classically activated macrophages phenotype. And that's usually sufficient um, to clear the infections. But if the infection persists, these activated M1 phenotype macrophages can activate T helper 1 or T helper 17 type of response to uh, clear the pathogen. And there is collateral damage um, for that reason, probably a lot of autoimmune diseases are associated with TH1 or TH7 type of uh, uh, response. But in case of uh, macroscopic parasites like helmet, helmet release some factors. We do not know what are the initial factors um, that helmet associated factors that can directly induce into type of response, which is anti inflammatory and tissue protective. Uh, phenotype of macrophages. We do not know, we do not still understand the mechanism. Hopefully, my lab will be able to uh, show some mechanistic way uh, how the net pathway can directly activate M2 phenotype. Well, at this moment, eventually, T2 type of response occurs. T2 type of response is alpha and alpha T. And alpha and alpha T can further activate macrophages and the M2 type of response, which is important to clear the pathogen, as well as these macrophages, uh, M2 type of macrophages produce factors which are involved in tissue remodel. And this is very important because these are eukaryotes, the parasites, they are migrating in the tissue, so tissue regeneration is needed. So, and besides, these uh, mediators can also prevent the, uh, the activity of 
pathology TH1 or T75 of a small. So that's another story that the helmet parasite probably can prevent or can prevent autoimmune diseases. But that's for another day. Um, okay. So, but one interesting thing is, okay, till now what we know, I4, I13, I10, those are the factors necessary for M2 type of cells development. But in our model, we do not see R4 or R10 or R13 to a most uh, to a detectable level. So, so that was very interesting. So how the macrophages are turning to alternate bracket macrophages? So as you can see here, this is one with post infection of uh, brain tissue of uh, stain of uh, I have uh, stained, uh, no fluorescent stain with antibodies specific to YM1, Feed1, Arginus1, and although it is not visible from here, you can appreciate that green color, which is the sedimentary positive infiltrative cells in the meningeal areas, or uh, subventricular areas in the brain, they are expressing uh, or co-localized with all these markers positive for alternate bacteria to macrophages. <coughs> Even if at one post infection, by one post infection, we do see a case one type of response that means T cells are producing, some T cells are producing I and gamma, and those are gamma delta T cells, but we still do not see any NOS to expression in this kind of cells. So A1 expression is very uh, near or undetected. In star 6 knockout mice, where the M type of response is completely aggravated, um, these mice they die within two weeks post infection. The wild type mice they can survive months and sometimes up to a year, but uh, the star six knockout mice they never reach two weeks post infection. So that means that aims are very important. But now the question is how the aims are far. One possibility is that they are probably uh, the antigens are separated into the blood And in bone marrow, the macrophages are turned into uh, M2 phenotype and they are trafficking into the brain. The other thing probably there is in a human pathway involved in this process. And the, also another important question is what exactly the effect of forms on these, these alternate lactate macrophages does in the CNS environment. With that, so when you talk about innate pathway, so that means parent and PR interaction. So when we look at the literature, almost 95% seropositive antigens in case of uh, neurocytosis patient is positive for glycan antigens. So, and also we know that in, uh, just like in the tumor, parasites have some glycan antigens that mimic also like tumor antigens. And parasites use that for immune invasion. So to figure it out, what kind of colored antigen or glycan antigens this parasite is releasing during the infection process, we uh, stain the parasite with plant lectins. As we know, the lectins point to um, carbohydrates or glycans. So these lectins are fluorescent to level. Al I said before, which binds to alpha uh, galactose or group uh, galactosomine. Uh, binds to galactose forming, binds to mannose or WG glucosamine. But so these parasites, where we know that they are expressing these antigens, they infect the parasites, um, mice with the parasites. But they want post infection, as you can see here, the parasite is entering into the brain tissue, they are releasing um, alpha galactose or galactosamine containing molecules. By one post infection, these parasites they completely release the isogenic material. In contrast, the WJ binding material, which is glucosamine containing molecule, they are constantly released throughout the infection period, and they are also present in the anatomical region, which are sedated in the positive cells. Well, these antigens also can, these lectins also can bind the host uh, cell types. So we did a lot of uh, other uh, uh, characterization with uh, using human patient serum, infected mouse serum, and some biochemical analysis. So we know that these are uh, parasite-derived bacteria. So 
again, we have I'm not going to show those uh, uh, data here, but the bottom line is the take-up message is where can antigens, particularly galactose or galactosamine containing molecules, they are really early during infection. In glucosamine containing molecules, they are released throughout the infection period that we analyze. Now, did we hypothesize that these primary antigens will induce expression of receptors, specific receptors for better antigens such as mm -hmm. lectin receptors. And those lectin receptors probably will have a role in the differentiation or development of m 2 hypomacrophages, trafficking of the cells, or the effect of functional phenotype of these type of cells. With that, we uh, what are the important things known about lectin receptors? Well, they bind to like an antigen. They play major role in homeostatic forms. They are major homeostatic functions. Uh, they are involved in clearing apoptotic cells. Uh, particularly, macrophages are involved in this process. They are also involved in tissue remodeling. Not many studies, have, but some studies uh, uh, have shown that. And also, some of the lectin receptors uh, are involved in glucoside trafficking. So, with uh, that, we analyzed, uh, we used multiplex RT-PCR uh, uh, arrays, almost uh, all the known uh, lectin receptors, and then we saw the expression profile in parasite infected uh, brains versus moth infected brains, um, and uh, several uh, lectin receptors were upregulated, and accordingly, we prioritized the uh, acquired knockout mice to study the effects. And we have nine knockout mice uh, to, and we tested um, their role uh, or the disease phenotype in those knockout mice. Um, and all these receptors are specific for either galactosomite or glucosomite. Okay? So, but for this presentation, I'll be focusing on galactins. Galactins are receptors, lectin receptors that bind to the galactose type of uh, terminal uh, molecules. So, and besides, as I just mentioned, that the galactose uh, containing glycans are released early, so basically our priority, uh, priority was like receptors that bind to galactose containing molecules. So, we um, we synthesized the primer and uh, here we analyzed uh, all the galactins uh, um, um, expression in infected mouse brain. So these are the galactins uh, have been identified in mouse. So as you can see, most of the galactins, uh, except galactin 12, have a, around two, two, two fold in each, but uh, some of them um, um, uh, more uh, substantially more amount of increase at this gene expression. But then also we did uh, analyze the protein expression and since brain anatomical region has different anatomical region has different type of functions, so we prefer immunofluorescent staining because we can not only see the expression but, but also distribution of this uh, um, of, of this uh, molecule. So out of all the galactins, we found that galactin 3, galactin 7, 8, and 9, they are detected at the protein level. Galactin 3 was purely detected in the interpretive myelin cells, while uh, galactin 7 specifically on the endothelial cells, and particularly cells that are present in the PR, associated with the PR cells. And we know that PR vessels are associated with the uh, cellular trafficking, immune cells trafficking to the brain. So galactin A, we found specifically on astrocytes. It's kind of a marker because uh, almost all the GATP positive cells were uh, detected or co localized with galactin A, and galactin A was detected in uh, minor cells as well as astrocytes. So we acquired these three knockout mice, galactin A knockout mice that are, that are available to anybody. And here I will present the data from galactin 3 and galactin 9 knockout points. Uh, galactin 9 knockout points, galactin 9 functions, uh, the mechanism uh, we do not know yet. We 
know the disease or we know the phenotype of these mice, but we do not have yet a conclusive mechanism of uh, how it is what. But for galactic tree, galactic nine, as the subsequent slides will uh, uh, convince us that I think we know the mechanism involved. As you can see here, that uh, most of the galactic tree positive cells are also positive uh, for NGL1 and 2. NGL1 and 2 is a marker for alternate electrode macrophages. So, given the expression of galactic tree, specifically by N2 macrophages in CC brain, we hypothesize that galactic tree um, mice will probably so an altered disease phenotype um, as compared to the wild type infected mice. As you can appreciate here, the mice, wild type and galactic tree knockout mice were infected with the m and the survivor was monitored and galact indeed galactic tree knockout mice were um, highly susceptible to this infection. However, the parasite burden was uh, not any different. And we also um, looked at the uh, extra parental versus parenchymal uh, uh, region parasite burden, there is no difference. And that can be important in this kind of infection. However, the immunopathological analysis here, I'm presenting the data from HNH study, we also did some lots of fast blue study that showed that in typically at, uh, in case of wild type of uh, mice, around three weeks post infection. We see neuronal death, as you can see those big cells, and uh, around that uh, microbiosis is happening. But in case of galactic mice, it was very much evident by the post I know that we, we see even few of those microbiosis areas in red parenchyma at one post infection, but it was very much evident at two post infection and more robust at three post infection in galactic knockout mice, suggesting that. Um, the brain of this, uh, there is more uh, tissue pathology in the galactic tree knockout mice brain uh, during infection. Another interesting thing we looked we found that uh, galactic tree knockout mice uh, brain exhibit cells, infiltrating cells with bilateral nucleus that's typically associated with nucleus. That was very exciting because helmet infection is associated with fusion field, not neutrophils. That's a fundamental biology, micro microscopic, macroscopic organism. Neutrophils versus fusion field. So it was uh, very interesting to see that uh, a lot of neutrophils are present in the living brain of our wise brain. And uh, so we also did some immunofluorescence training here um, using 74 antigen, which is very specific neutrophil no unlike NYC or NYC And as you can appreciate that the galactic tree knockout mice brain um, shows uh, presence of lots of 7 4 positive cells. We also did the pro cytometry and um, as you can see in the galactic tree uh, knockout mice uh, brain are three post infection and I know that at two weeks post infection too. We don't see any difference at one week post infection. By two to three weeks post infection, there is a robust increase in number of neutrophils present in the infected uh, uh, directly infected brain as compared to the wild brain. We also monitor the presence of uh, alternate lactate and um, because there was a study in 2007 from Judith Allen group that uh, in star 6 knockout mice peritoneum, uh, in Brugian Allen infection, when there is less AM, it was correlated with more neurons. So, but uh, you know, we don't know the mechanism till now. So, we thought maybe there is less uh, alternate factor in macrophages in the brain. But in contrast, we saw, sorry, that in the collective brain of our mice, um, uh, at three post infection, alternate lactate and macrophages numbers are more as compared to wild type mice. Where 80% cells in wild type mice are uh, from AIMS, but uh, in case of galactic, you know, our mice are 90% We also analyzed with F480 to 2 
जगह एम आर आर एंटीजेंट टू दे आर द सिग्नेचर मार्कर सर्फेस मार्कर फॉर अल्टरनेट मैथड एंड मैथ सो दिस अगेन सजेस्ट दैट इन गैलेक्टिक फ्रेम ऑफ अबाउट माइस वी हैव मोर टू प्रोसेस एंड मोर एन एंड इन थर्ड मीडिएटर्स वी एनालाइज अराउंड आई थिंक सिक्स टी मीडिएटर्स वी डिड हैव एन क्लियर परफेक्शन but we saw at one is for spectral some of the molecules included molecules like neotaxin 2 or go on alpha was higher but we can see in a lot of difference in wild type and galactic knockout mice uh, um, as far as the internal mediator subculture so so what can be the possibility so we thought okay maybe There is a defect in uh, macrophages, particularly activated macrophages, functional. Mm -hmm. So we specifically thought to look at macrocytosis, and it helps if your wife is also working on something uh, like you know she's working on macrocytosis. So we were always able to get the chance to hear about it. So um, so we tried that. Um, what is macrocytosis? Ah, oh, okay. so we have extra technical. Uh, okay, I'll finish. Thanks. Uh, so, okay, so what we did, so essentially, essentially, it is clearance of the dead uh, cell. So, what we did here, we collected neutrinos from bone marrow, uh, we collected neutrinos from bone marrow or peritoneal uh, from the mouse peritoneum after time and different. And uh, into macrophages, we isolated either in vitro. We derived the bone marrow macrophages by treating with IL-4, or from parasite-infected mice, or from mice uh, injected intraperitoneally with IL-4 complex. So, with three different approaches, we purified uh, alternate lactic macrophages. And what we observed that, irrespective of the origin of the alternate lactic macrophages, the into macrophages they have Less nucleus, which are seen basically positive for uh, staying here, and as you can see here, there's six hundred percent, six hundred percent, six hundred percent, six hundred percent. So that you must imagine that at this place, a prominent bone in front of the disease is very difficult in front of the process of getting the process. Now I'll go quickly uh, on this aspect that uh, it is very exciting to see that galactic cell was only detected in endothelial cell. As you can see here, that endothelial cells especially and the interferon cells are adhering to that. So, and these mice, like this in a certain number of mice, they are also highly susceptible to this infection. And uh, initially, we saw a high parasite burden by at one week post infection, but uh, at the three week post infection, we didn't see any uh, increased parasite burden. And these mice uh, didn't display any. Difference in the protein number, but we observed uh, from the initial pathological study that it's uh, it, uh, less uh, immune infiltrates in galactic cell knockout mice. And uh, by doing further analysis, we saw only the Y1 feed one or M1 angular positive for sediment positive cells, which are typically for M type of uh, uh, cells. They are much less in galactic cell knockout mice as compared to wild animals. Surprisingly, we didn't see any difference in neutrophil number, but we did see a drastic uh, difference in uh, number of particle uh, uh, activated macrophages in galactic cell knockout mice. As you can see here, from 10.2% to 5% uh, or 10% to 5% period to an MR quantity of cells. So again, uh, this, uh, this uh, by uh, MR analysis, we also verified that any type of response is less in galactic cell knockout mice. Then it was very attractive for us that is there any defect in the trafficking of uh, this cell type? So what ideally, and we plan to do that, we want to use conditional knockout mice, galactic cell conditional knockout on the endothelial cells and do put on uh, microscopy. Uh, but at this moment, but we, we don't have those uh, uh, resources yet. Um, so what we did, we leveled the wild type uh, macrophages with CFC, and uh, uh, we injected at day six uh, uh, NCC mice intravenously this leveled parasite 
then it was automatically to measure the number of cells in the infected uh, frame. But we saw that there is a decreased accumulation of these uh, empty macrophages in the galactic seven of our mice frame. So, so this the take message is galactins are differentially expressed and they modulate the or they regulate the disease severity. Galactin 3 by controlling ectocytosis while galactin 7 by controlling the, the trafficking. I will just briefly um, go with uh, uh, my post uh, I didn't present anything from Arun. He was on the genetic and uh, 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 in vitro system. And uh, Bharat, uh, he was uh, uh, on other aspect of our work on uh, autoimmune disease model, but Arun uh, finds the mechanism in an inhibitor model and translates that to an autoimmune disease model. And both, all the data I presented was generated by my uh, great trust in my studies and believe me, she has data from, from another four knockout points. So I am very proud of Bharat and sorry, Arun and Freddy, not that I am not proud of Bharat, uh, and also other people. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. So, on this case, does he classify as some kind of endogenous dietary form here in the United States? I don't know. But most likely here it is, uh, most likely here they are induced because of the PR part. Uh, after an initial insult, age, an injury, or an infection, uh, 
that results in activation of these innate immune cells, hydrate cells, and any species. And after that, it results in a variety of different pathways playing a role. That is, a back and forth crosstalk between these pathways that results in an inflammatory response. And as I mentioned, it can either lead to the resolution of the initial insult, uh, uh, bringing the body to the constant state of uh, functioning, or it can result in a non result so the, the factors, host factors, that are playing a role in balancing uh, this inflammatory response, that is a key thing that many laboratories have studied in, in terms of how to control this inflammation in diseases. And we as well are looking to uh, some of those factors. And so one of the research foresight uh, based on that is uh, we are looking at the post-pathogen interaction because we use bacterial infections as the positive. Uh, agent of uh, the substance and also other cells, nuclear functions, in the regular substances, and pneumonia is our more bacterial infection. And so, uh, one of the main functions that we are interested, we actually have become interested in looking at in the past uh, two, three years, is formation of these unique structures called extracellular plants. So, these uh, Structures or this phenomenon of nuclear function or in this paradigm of nuclear activation, if you will, it was discovered back in 2004. It's, so it's a fairly recent phenomenon that has been discovered and I was still post up in the years and I can still remember, if I can remember, the Zeppelin paper, the Nature paper in the Department of German how everybody was just so fascinated with nuclear, just like loyal soldiers, even when they are dying. They are spewing out these contents to be able to kill the bacteria of the pathogens. So this was very fascinating. And at that time, little did I know that this is going to become very important in the future of my lab. So uh, neutrophil extracellular caps, turns out that these uh, neutrophils, they can get activated by a variety of different camps or uh, even the endogenous molecules. And what happens uh, is that there is a uh, very complex signaling events. They take place in the cytosol, which results in chromatin decondensation, nuclear membrane disintegration, eventually causing their DNA to be spewed out of these cells and out of these fibers. And these fibers, they are coated with proteases from the granular contents of these nucleus. So these can have, these uh, fibers can actually trap the microorganisms viruses, uh, even parasites, bacteria, of course. And they can kill without the need of fibrocytation. And so, interestingly, a few years ago, it was, uh, you know, written by Newton now we are understanding that these nets, actually, they have a role to play in, in sepsis in a way that in a resolving type of inflammation, they to get the non-severe sepsis. These nucleus, when they are functioning, Properly. They go to the site of infection and they fibrocytize the bacteria and lose their reactive oxygen and nitric oxygen uh, species, nitric oxide species, to kill the bacteria in the cell as well as they produce nets. So the result, ultimate result is that these uh, bacteria are contained. Uh, it is a local infection. Uh, that inflammation helps clear that bacteria to bacterial uh, insult and then inflammation results. But as in case of severe sepsis, happens is that these nucleus they have to go variety of changes, which uh, on one hand results in their lack of migration, lack of their ability to migrate to the site of infection. And then uh, in that process what happens is that these nucleus they start to be activated on route in the system, in, in the systemic uh, 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 pathway, in the turbulence. So by way of interaction with a variety of cell types in those capillaries, these nucleus they start producing nets, and these nets in turn they deregulate coagulation cascades, they cause endothelial damage. As a result of that, these capillaries they get caught, and the end result is that the, the organs they don't get produced and they are quite spread causing damage permanently. And so, as you can appreciate that the nets, initially, if they are formed, they are protected. They are 
taking care of the infection. But if they are formed too much or later at the stage, they seem to be doing pathological growth. So you can appreciate that if we can understand how these nets are formed, the mechanism of their form, uh, formation, then you can uh, uh, modulate the formation of these nets at your will. So, so that's one of the things that we are really uh, looking forward to. So obviously we cannot do everything in the human uh, cells or the subject, so we have to have many models. So the three clinical models that we use uh, in our lab are significant glasses mice, which are infected with uh, bacterial pathogens. The two pathogens that we use are Coxiella pneumonia and Coxiella viruses. And so uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the uh, infection model that involves Coxiella as a gram negative extracellular pathogen. Positive uh, agent of uh, immunity acquired pneumonia and respiratory uh, infections, positive acquired infections. 20% of the most interesting thing is, or the important and most relevant thing is that uh, almost 20% of the pneumonia success cases are associated with uh, Coxiella infections. And very recently, the drug resistance, antibiotic resistance, has become a huge problem uh, uh, in case of this, this pathogen. So this makes this is the uh, model of the which is very relevant. And so this uh, cartoon shows the working hypothesis that's in uh, place in my lab. So all of the projects, they are looking at one or the other aspects that's mentioned on this slide. So after an initial bacterial infection, one infection in, in our case, there is a human or neutral influx to the lab. And these neutrophils, they uh, are uh, basically uh, trying to take care of the infection uh, during this initial injury by criticizing these uh, bacteria as well as forming these nets. And also, since uh, these um, neutrophils are short cells, once they have performed their function, they have to, they, they die and they have to clear. So that happens by a process called echosynthesis. You must have heard that Chris talk about this process during his research uh, seminars. So, uh, as long as the bacterial clearance as well as the clearance of the dead cells is going on properly, the body will be able to reach the homeostatic state. Any deactivation in any of these processes will result, typically result, in pathological processes. So, for today's talk, I'm going to focus only on a project that's going to go on the formation of the next. So, we can see. so uh, one of the things before I get into the data, uh, what we have acquired, a number of different pathways have been proposed and have been shown to be a great for different extracellular craft formation and net formation. All of them, they converge to formation of reactive oxygen species in the universe. So, reactive oxygen species for gross is uh, shown to be very essential uh, for formation of the because this loss, it results in, uh, it causes the disintegration of the granules in the cytosol of the nucleus and also uh, the disintegration of the nuclear membrane, which results in skewing of these uh, DNA fibers outside, outside of the cells. So then, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, several reports started coming in where the nucleus had retained the passages from loss, but they were not able to form nets. So it turns out that there is another uh, pathway that is involved in net formation that is accomplished. However, it's very, very recent and proximal signaling pathways for any receptor uh, that, has, that is involved in activation of autophagy and whether or not there is any possible to gain loss in autophagy is coming. And so uh, these two pathways uh, seem to be the major players And so uh, one of the things that we are working on in the labs, the lab is a uh, role of CDAP reference, and I'm not going to go into details because I'm going to just go over the uh, vector receptors of CDAP reference. And uh, we, when we started this work, we did microarray analysis of a bunch of uh, different CLRs playing a role in demonic substance in Hospital CLR and Francisella, and we zero down on probably 12 or 13 different. Uh, CLRs 
and we acquired constant mice from various different places, and we looked at their responses to infection, mice infection, and infection, so on. And we have now uh, uh, sort of zeroed down on three main CLRs that we are working on in the lab right now. So today I'm going to talk about MIMO. That's one of the receptors that we have found that plays an important role in uh, CLR DNA infection. And this uh, receptor has been shown to be a PR and as a PR for mycobacterium as well as some fungal uh, infections. Also, it is able to recognize endogenous molecules like hardness. And the end result of this recognition is the activation of site hardening pathway, which results in formation of uh, uh, internal cytokines, which, uh, which have been shown to be. So what we did was we had these clinical knockout mice that we had acquired from uh, the social for function and learning centers. And we infected intranasally, uh, like intranasally with Crepsil ammonia and found out that these mice were extremely susceptible to that infection. They had uh, much higher bacterial burden in their lungs compared to white and animals which sort of got the infection and were able to resolve. And in their lungs we saw accumulation uh, of uh, these new protocols resulting in a lot of pathology uh, uh, in comparison to the white animals, which again show kind of transient uh, cellular infiltration, which is resolved over a period of time. And so uh, around the same time when we were looking at this, uh, there were papers that, that showed that NETS can play a protective role in terms of clearing Clepsiera and so uh, we wanted to see, obviously we wanted to see if the presence or absence of mimic plays any role in that formation in these animals. So we looked at uh, the, the neutrophils in the lungs of these animals and lo and behold, mimic knockout neutrophils they were formed. And so that gave us, and this, this was a pretty significant difference in the water. And so that, that gave us a way or a, a model to dissect out uh, the molecular mechanism of that formation in our infection. And so what we did, the first thing we wanted to do was whether uh, Minkan is playing any direct role in the net formation. So what we did was we, uh, 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 we took the neutrophils white type or Minkan knockout and then stimulated them with PMA and FMA and we might ask why not KPM. Because in vitro, when we hit these neutrophils with KPM, so KPM directly is not in the same the net formation in that in the field of web CLR and the infection is pretty common. But uh, there is a separate project in the lab that we're going on where uh, we are trying to understand what we are trying to identify the line that might involve people that is doing that in the But regardless, in vitro we use this PMA, this PMA and FMLP as which are the widely accepted uh, uh, stimulants for neutrophils. And in response to these stimulants as well, the mutual knockout neutrophils they were formed as. And we also used fire and knockout experiments which showed the same thing that mutual knockout neutrophils are highly efficient in formation of the gas. And then since I showed that ROS is central to that formation, so we wanted to see if ROS is deficient in mutual knockout because of which they are not forming neutrophils, it doesn't look like that. Because mutual knockout neutrophils, they are uh, comparable in terms of ROS formation. Uh, uh, as the white and also we confirmed the same thing using the SIR as well. So mitochondrial ROS can also contribute to the, the reactive oxygen pool of the cells. So we looked at microROS as well, mitochondrial ROS. It turns out that uh, in response to the stimulation, there is no change in microROS, so it doesn't look like it plays any role in that formation. It is PM stimulated as and mice. Uh, and so next, we wanted to see if adopted A is involved in this process. And uh, lo and behold, it looked like the Minkanakov nucleus, they were deficient in the uh, And LC3 processing uh, into S3-1, uh, uh, processing of S3-1 to S3-2, as well as S3 hunter in uh, the cytosol of nucleus, it's, it's a very long accepted uh, Marker for topology and relation and you cannot help me because these are beautiful pictures and it's a pity that you cannot see them. But there are beautiful punta in 
bite-sized uh, neutrophil, uh, neutrophils uh, in response to EMA in the activation of phenolphagy, which is not uh, there in the Pokemon uh, As well as by Western dots, uh, we showed that LC3 uh, processing to LC3 2 was deficient uh, in nickel knockout uh, neutrophils in response to EMA. Now, what am I saying is an activator of phenolphagy? And uh, the way we see it, uh, rapamycin did not have any effect uh, on in the wild type animals as well in response to PMA or by itself. Uh, so it looks like that the PMA could, uh, could activate the opportunity to a certain threshold after which rapamycin didn't have any effect. And it did not revert that, was not able to revert the activation of the pathogen in the normal So since rapamycin didn't work, we tried out several different uh, uh, molecules or, or reagents to induce autophagy in these uh, nickel knockout as well as white activities. We were trying to see if activation of autophagy can be worked back or rescue the net condition we had in the knockout uh, So uh, we stumbled upon this FDA approved drug, which is being used for a completely different disorder uh, right now. So it's an FDA approved drug. It's a no autophagy inducer. It activates the autophagy pathway at several different uh, local points in that, in that pathway. And uh, treatment of NICO knockout neutrophils with this particular uh, drug would revert back to the formation of uh, NAPs to a level which we were seeing in the And so was apparent uh, by the activation of autophagy, as you can see, the SC32 by the same to work. So this was uh, really interesting. And so now we wanted to see whatever we are seeing in vitro in response to PMA, whether it goes through in vivo during uh, and pony infection as well. So that's what we saw here, that gross formation in y type and methanocrotin is compared. And these are neutrophils that have been isolated from the lungs of Crepsiera uh, infection animals. And also we saw that density from patient in y type is do not show as a precondition. And the same is true with the Western block, as if the processing is not there. And we also tested another uh, protein, vector non which is in all that is that is in the uh, And so we wanted to piece together the uh, pathway, the molecular signaling pathway, downstream protein, uh, downstream of uh, info. So first we looked at site partnering pathway. Surprisingly, we saw that uh, phosphocyte as well as the cardinal, it's not affected at all in response to TMA in the uh, And we also, and we knock out the cardinal using SIR, it doesn't have any effect on that formation. And also the B38 and her pathway, antagonist pathways, which have been shown to play a role in that formation, they are not also, you know, they don't seem to be involved. And so what I show you here now is that Minkle, not, uh, Minkle is playing a role in formation of NEPs via autophagy, by activation of autophagy, and uh, we are still uh, trying to figure out the molecular details of this pathway. And it is in that process, we have identified an adapter, which is a mobile adapter. It has not even been reported in neutral cells. And that has been shown to be involved in formation of uh, completely different uh, adaptive immune cells. So, so we are very excited with this discovery and we are trying to work out uh, this pathway. And so I told you about the yin of NEXT, the good things that the NEXT have done. NEXT can do bad things as well, as I showed you in this instructions, as well as has been shown in several other diseases uh, like arthritis or uh, mucus, cystic fibrosis, as well as uh, that these NEMs, they can actually induce autoimmune responses. Why? Because the DNA itself is uh, can act as uh, a stimulant for activation of cells, as well as these DNA fibers, they are coated with uh, essentially cell factors. So that induces an autoimmune response in these diseases, and it's very well known. And so that led us to look at the role of NEMs in the genesis of a chronic uh, lung inflammation, inflammation disease. Uh, and this is a uh, 
very uh, significant healthcare burden, 30 cause of cancer in the US, and more than 11 million people have been uh, diagnosed. And so we want to see uh, whether uh, the next has any role to play in the pathology of this disease. Why? Because there is a system, even though it's a chronic uh, lung disease, there is a, a, a huge nutritive component to it. Uh, there is persistent accumulation of nutrients. They are hyperactive, and there is also presence of autoimmune bodies in the state of these patients. And so, what we hypothesized based on some of the preliminary data uh, that we acquired and based on the research research is that cigarette smoking is a huge risk factor for developing COP. So, we hypothesized that cigarette smoke uh, uh, it activates the neutrophils in mucin-mediated fashion, which results in exuberant formation of the next and which uh, contribute to the information that is so characteristic of this disease. And so for that, we have <coughs> uh, collaboration with uh, some patients in Mayo, acquired some COP emission samples. Although those lung slices were not in the best preserved state, but we could see the formation, the exuberant formation of next in those samples. We also did some MRI analysis and saw that those patients that they express uh, high levels of MECO, uh, and also, some of the in vitro studies that we performed showed that the cigarette smoke extract in vitro would induce the deformation in winkle detecting matter, which winkle not only because they didn't respond to cigarette smoke. And interestingly, some of uh, the patients sit up of these smoker uh, CO2 patients, they uh, recognize uh, very contained antigens on, on the neutrophil nets, indicating that there is an auto antibody response uh, being mounted in these patients. So, this is a very new project, and we are uh, currently uh, involved in examining and characterizing these uh, net formation in these CO2 uh, patient samples as well as looking at mineral mediated uh, net formation uh, in, in CO2. Uh, so, I told you about the good things uh, that NETS do and is uh, an FDA approved drug, uh, TX, that can induce the NET formation in conditions where uh, it is deficient. So, now can we uh, change the NETS? Can we reduce or, or uh, mitigate the NET formation in conditions where there is exuberant NET So, Dr. Mishra talked to you about the plastic infections, they are characterized by an absence of. So he had identified a parasitic molecule which is immune suppressive. So we wanted to see whether that parasitic molecule has any effect on that as well. So as you can see here, when we treat the neutrophils uh, with this parasitic molecule and function goes on. And the same is true in septic patients as well. So when we take the septic patient neutrophils, treat them with this parasitic molecules, they are not producing, they don't produce an acid in response to EMA and several other as well. So now we have this molecule which can induce, uh, which can mitigate the net formation. So in, in summary, what I showed you was that we have identified this novel, the uh, that uh, uh, sort of controls the net formation uh, by way of regulating pathology. So in that sense, we have identified a new receptor that regulates pathology as well. And this immune pathway turns out to be a non canonical immune pathway to this sidecar 9 it doesn't seem to be involved in this process. And we have found out uh, ways uh, by which we can modulate the information in, in uh, a micro environment, specific uh, environment. We can increase it using uh, TX or we can reduce it uh, using HF. And we believe that because of these properties, the molecular analysis. Uh, these uh, observations have been wide wide applications to other In the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the work that has been done in my lab. I didn't do anything. My postdocs and graduate uh, students have worked on this. So the work that I showed you today has been done by my very talented postdoc, Dr. Sharma, and that's just part of what he's doing. Uh, Christopher Jungle is my uh, fifth year graduate student. He will be graduating next year. And he is working on a very fascinating project where uh, FLEXIOS is going to be modulating the FLEXIOS. And he is also looking at the role of certain CLRs in this, not only this process, but uh, 
formation of uh, grammars and more grammars. And my other postdoc is working on, and Dr. Swati is working on uh, attachment signaling in uh, necrosis and epigenetic signals uh, in functions. And Dr. Bukhari we just arrived yesterday, and we have talked about a few uh, projects that he's going to work on, some of uh, which are listed here, but there are others that we talked about. So is very important. Uh, and uh, my lab leader is uh, Johan and uh, Uda. Uh, she is the ex student, uh, medical student, and a number of other graduates. I have just lost count. So many have come and gone, and they have helped the students and postdocs in so many different ways. It's just a tremendous help. And uh, my collaborators and the rest of the resources.
It is known that you can't enter the cell with the central mediated immunosynthesis and enter first into the phenosomatosome system. From there, pet can escape. So this is what we're going to focus on today. So we got the cell and we throw the pet in nothing. Try different cells. This is one cell. We try different cells. Nothing. Unless we treat the cells with the form, which is a, a, a base, a wood base that tends to accumulate in the immunosomatosome and elevate the, the pH. And when we look at uh, different concentrations of chloroquine, you can see a bell shape activation. And uh, this is uh, just speculation. What we think is that, so the tag escaping the endosolasmosomes requires important concentration. Um, this set, if you don't have enough concentration of protein, the tag cannot get off. On the other side, this more acidic environment will lead to more degradation so, but this is just uh, speculation. So, so if, if we can make lysosome more acidic, let's see if we can prevent the cat So we're trying to find uh, a strategy that can uh, be, uh, can acidify the lysosome. And one thing stand out is this uh, phospholipid PI part E2, which are first specifically localized on latent zone and lysosome. And this melson is one of analog PI E2, has been shown to activate uh, the calcium channel on the lysosome. So we treat this out with Melsa or PI352, you can see drop in pH acidification of the light. And then if we look at the transactivation, advanced transactivation. Both. So we think if the pH is so critical for the tag escaping the you know what? You know, So currently, we were trying to identify, so this is first simplified word. There's early endosome, late endosome, or second endosome, there's uh, light late endosome. And uh, so we're trying to, to identify where exactly had that gets off, and how exactly. So we're trying to identify the transporter. We're thinking it's the transporter. Uh, so we're trying to identify Transporters that can mediate the type transport out of the <coughs> lysosome and enter the And then now we move up to, to the receptor level. So the RRP1, which has been shown in neuron, are mediated the type internalization. So we're trying to see if this is the case for this exercise. And uh, we treated the cell with uh, our RP1 attacks to the rat. So you can see the rat will concentration dependent uh, preventing the uh, attack induced transplantation. When we knock down the RP1, it prevents So that's good. So in brain, the RRP1 is a major receptor for ApoE, which is the, uh, the apolipoprotein in brain that transport cholesterol, lipid, and cholesterol. 
and there are three actual forms of equity. They're changing uh, the differences on um, amino acid on um, 112 and 158. See, you can see such simple changes in amino acid change the structure and function of equity. This is equity four, this is equity three. They change the lipid binding and receptor binding. So let's see if there's differences between ApoE and CAP transaction. So look at ApoE2, it has very nice concentration dependent uh, decrease on CAP transaction. Same thing with ApoE3. But if we look at ApoE4, the preventative uh, effects are much less. <laughs> then we we'll look at the, uh, the, the formation of the effects is that we we mix FOE with HDL. So we want to see whether this is the HDL kind of effects. So we treated the cell just with LDL. There's no effect on cat And we treated just with FOE for peptide. It has similar effect with FOE combined with HDL. So it doesn't seem to be lipid. And then we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, the receptor binding site on apple. So this is the uh, receptor. This is the apple. Right? This part is the receptor binding cell. And uh, so this, so we, people have been using this called a apple mimetic peptide. It's just basically the same sequence on the receptor binding cell. And uh, another ApoE uh, receptor packing mimicking peptide is called uh, the tandem, tandem repeat peptide. So you can see the tandem repeat, LRP, LRP, that's the tandem repeat, and dimer too. So then we'll look, as you can see, the ApoE peptide. And if we look at dimer, so so we're thinking this is the apple e binding the tag transactivation effect by competing with the binding side. So when, so so as I mentioned before, this is the uh, ApoE ApoE isoform dependent events, right? So the ApoE three has nice uh, decrease on cat transactivation. ApoE four does not. So people are using uh, a strategy that could. So this is the ApoE four. And we realize people have been using this strategy to make FOE structure look like and maybe function like FOE break. So this is the molecule that can break this bonding to extend that arm on the elliptic bands. So we we treated the cells with FOE4 or ApoE4 fracture, the, the structure fracture. And it does seem to work. The catch is that you have to premix the structure fracture with the ApoE. If you just uh, throw everything ApoE4 and uh, 
this molecule, small molecule, intermediate that is So that is to a summary. So we're thinking the pH very critical for fat escaping the universal atmosphere. And we're trying to identify the, the transport that we need. And uh, LRP is essential for fat internalization and trans activation. And uh, FOE prevents fat Transactivation by uh, impeding the banking on the IR. And with that, I would like to thank the bar, the postdoc who primarily gen generated this data, and some data generated by the, the last computation measurements by Yang, and then Johnson Dagger and Nina.
Yes, uh, I think uh, with uh, that more time we will be treated with different uh, ways in that can kind of appear. We we'll see similar value. So I was thinking that the near uh, a critical pH levels. So if the pH goes up, that means protein goes down. To a certain level, they don't have energy to get off. Goes down, and and same thing. They will not be degraded, but they, they don't have energy to go up. 